Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Unzan Chitta. In a world where in the degenerate age, the Dharma teachings are in danger of being lost, who should come to save the day but Bodhidharma, master of Zen? Yesterday, October 5th, was uh, Bodhidharma Day, and of course we're a day late and the proverbial dollar short. But if you're watching this on YouTube, it's no longer anywhere near Bodhi Day anyway, right? So. In honor of Bodhidharma Day, I thought I would talk a wee bit about Bodhidharma. And uh, he is the first Chan patriarch. And there are some really great stories about Bodhidharma. In fact, right above me, you can see a scroll with Bodhidharma on it that a friend of mine sent to me a long time ago now, as it turns out. <clears throat> So Bodhidharma, he either came from Afghanistan, Pakistan, somewhere in that general vicinity, west of Kashmir, maybe, or alternatively from South India, or alternatively, again, Sri Lanka. There are uh, a couple of movies about Bodhidharma. There's one um, in China that's called, indeed, Bodhidharma, Master of Zen. And that one's kind of interesting because they've got this sort of rotund character with a really bad bald wig, right? Like it's bald on top and then it's got this fringe sticking out around the side. And I suspect that Bodhidharma would have not looked like that. But then again, there are some uh, movie uh, trailers or ads from uh, Sri Lanka in which Bodhidharma looks mighty buff. And I'm guessing there's a chance he probably didn't look like that either. And uh, so he came from the West. We don't know where in the West, but he came from the West into China somewhere around 1500 years ago. And there are a number of great, uh, possibly apocryphal stories about Bodhidharma. Perhaps they're not apocryphal at all and 100% literal truth. I don't know, I wasn't there, but they're great stories nonetheless. So one of the first ones is uh, his famous encounter with Emperor Wu. Uh, apparently, if you go with the story that he was the son of a king, much like someone else we know, and he forsook the royal life to become a Buddhist monk. So he, apparently his uh, cousin, I think it was, who became king, sent off carrier pigeons and uh, they basically carried a message that said, take care of this guy, he's, he's all right. So he goes and apparently there's some sort of buzz because this guy who the King of India says is cool is coming. So he encounters Emperor Wu and the interchange um, is sort of on the contrary side. Uh, Bodhidharma, without going into any detail, pretty much puts the uh, emperor in his place. And the final of the three questions that the emperor asks him is, who is this that's speaking to me like this? And Bodhidharma's answer was, don't know, which is, a main Zen point. There are others. Um, 
let's see, he sat in meditation staring at a wall for nine years. Uh, Rico, who was basically who wanted to be Bodhidharma's student really bad. I think he was like bringing him a bowl of rice every day that would go uneaten. And uh, so he eventually got up the nerve to say to Bodhidharma, uh, Master, please be my teacher. He said, why is that? He said, well, my mind is in disarray. And Bodhidharma says, show me your mind. Okay. Again, putting Rico in his place. Now, now Rico, who turns out to be the second patriarch of, of Chan, uh, he is so desperate to have Bodhidharma become his teacher that he cuts off his, I believe, left arm. And so I, of course, take that to be why I'd give an arm and a leg to be your student, Bodhidharma. There's also uh, some more bloodshed in the Bodhidharma story because in order to stay awake during meditation, he reportedly cut off his eyelids and where they fell grew the first tea trees or bushes, whatever it is that tea grows on in China. And that's why even to this day, uh, monks will drink really strong tea in order to keep from falling asleep during meditation because I guess they don't want to cut off their eyelids. To each his own, I suppose. Uh, what else? Is Bodhidharma um, surfed across the Yangtze on a reed. Nice. Not, not the usual way to get across the Yangtze, but he had a reed and he surfed it. Uh, what else? There's untold other ones, possibly the, uh, the biggest one that everybody would be aware of is that his, his temple was the Shaolin uh, temple. And of course, Shaolin is where Kung Fu is said to have uh, originated. And of course, you also have those sort of annual tours of the Shaolin monks doing all their acrobatics and whatnot. Whether Bodhidharma had anything much to do with that, I, I again can't say I wasn't there. One of the three things that uh, is basically attributed to Bodhidharma is something called outline of practice. And I have a little bit of it here and I'd like to read bits and pieces of it to you. So many methods lead to the path. However, fundamentally there are only two, reason and practice. To enter by reason means to realize the essence through instruction and to trust that all living things share the same true nature. Bodhidharma also at one point or another says something to the effect of, if you want to find the great way, find a teacher. Don't be led by your own delusions thinking it's your true self. Only one in a million without a teacher will actually become awakened. That's paraphrasing, of course. So there's there's one bit in here that I'm really fond of, and I I came to find out that I am not the only one who is uh, fond of this. Um, in the second of the elements there to enter practice, enter the path by practice, I should say. Um, there's four all-inclusive practices, experience injustice, adapting to conditions, 
seeking nothing and practicing the Dharma. Let me read this bit for you. First is the experience of injustice. When those who embark on the path encounter adversity, they should resolve that in the countless moments of my life gone by, I've turned from the essential to the trivial and wandered through all manner of conceptualizations, often angry without cause and guilty of numberless transgressions. This moment, though I do no wrong, I am allowing my past to control my present. Neither gods nor men can foresee when an incorrect deed will bear its fruit. I accept it with an open heart and without complaint of injustice. The sutras say, when you meet with adversity, don't be upset because it only makes sense. It only makes sense. Bodhidharma, of course, is referring to karma and not in some sort of metaphysical, woo-woo, cosmic retribution or praise. It's just this led to that. You did this, you got that. Don't be angry. It only makes sense. And that's also an element of seeking nothing, is that in, in the sense of our constant seeking, we often lose the way because we don't want things to be like this. We would rather they were like that. And as soon as we start doing that, we are that much further away from realizing our true nature. And the true nature is that essence in all beings, that inherently awakened state that we quite often will cover up with any matter of, you know, manure of daily living. So when we meet with adversity, when we're sitting here saying, oh, wah, I really wish it weren't like this. I really wish there weren't a pandemic. I really wish I didn't have to wear a mask all the time. I really wish I didn't get arrested for breaking and entering. Yeah, it just makes sense. It all makes sense. It's pure cause and effect. So don't be surprised if at some point or another, you may feel as if you're suffering injustice, that things aren't going your way. I know quite often I will have those feelings, uh, have the indignant, righteous anger, and I just have to remind myself that things are the way they are. Don't need my validation to be like they are. They may not be the way I like them, and the way that they are only makes sense.